Wait, what did it say? Time bonus. Hold up, let's hear that again. Time bonus. What happened? Did the guy have laryngitis or something when he voiced this part? Hey, what's going on guys? This is Poger coming at you with another video. So, I don't think Star Fox needs an introduction. It was a really nice Super Nintendo game when it came out, and it used the Super FX chip, which greatly enhanced the graphics on the game. So, when Sega looked at this, they realized, like, oh shoot, this makes our console look like garbage in comparison. So, they did something about it. What did they do? Well, let's check it out. When you put a quarter in an arcade cabinet, the game runs off the hardware that's inside. In most cases, the hardware was built specifically for the game it's running, and since the hardware and software were usually made by the same game developer, it gave them full control over how they wanted the game to play. For an example, if Nintendo was making an arcade game that needed a little extra processing power, they could more than likely just make adjustments to the hardware themselves since they created it. There was also a lot of room inside of an arcade cabinet to put the hardware in, so who cares if it's big and bulky? In the early 1980s, Atari started porting arcade games to their new home console, the 2600. Unlike an arcade cabinet, the 2600 was designed specifically for home use, so by default it was a smaller form factor and the hardware was designed to play many games, not just one. So when Atari first created the 2600, they weren't thinking, oh, how are we going to make asteroids with this? They were thinking about the bigger picture. What hardware specs do we need to accommodate most games? The hardware specs of the 2600 were also primitive compared to most arcade boards at the time. By making a game for a home console, you lose a little bit of freedom with how you want the game to play, because the console hardware might not allow for it. For these reasons, console ports of arcade games usually didn't look or play as well as the arcade counterpart. With that said, some game developers were looking into adding extra chips and coprocessors to the inside of cartridges. This would expand the capabilities of a game for when the home console's power just wasn't enough. An early example of this was the Atari 2600 version of Pitfall 2. Although this wasn't originally an arcade game, Activision added a chip inside of every copy of the game that drastically improved the game's music and sound. The 2600 wasn't the only console to do this. Many game developers were using chips and coprocessors in NES games as well, for an example, the Japanese version of Castlevania 3 used a coprocessor chip that added two extra sound channels, which drastically improved the sound quality of the game. There were also chips that could improve more than just the sound. The MMC3 chip, for an example, was used in games like Super Mario Bros. 3 and Kirby's Adventure, which allowed for split-screen scrolling and easy instant swapping of sprites and tiles. So as we can see, adding chips to cartridges was a common practice to give the game a little boost when the console's normal limitations were just not cutting it. Meanwhile, a British game company, Argonaut, was interested in porting their game Starglider to the NES. Starglider was a first-person 3D shooter that used wireframe 3D graphics that were not compatible with the NES. So they went right to work on an early version of what is known today as the Super FX chip. In 1990, Argonaut showed an NES version of Starglider, which used their early Super FX chip, to Nintendo. While they were impressed with what they saw, Nintendo suggested to shift focus to the upcoming Super Nintendo since the NES was becoming obsolete and its competitor, the Sega Genesis, was already out and had superior hardware to the NES. 
So Argonaut shifted focus to the Super Nintendo. Following up to 1993, Nintendo and Argonaut worked closely together to come up with a Super Nintendo game that utilized the Super FX chip. With some inspiration from their previous game Star Glider, they released Star Fox. The Super FX chip allowed the Super Nintendo to render 3D polygons and to help with advanced 2D effects. As we can see, this looks like no other Super Nintendo game. The Super Nintendo already had a convincing 3D effect with Mode 7, but the fact that there are actual 3D polygons is unbelievable. So what are the issues with this chip? Well for one, the frame rate really wasn't that good. You can definitely see that with a couple of the games. A lot of the games that supported the Super FX chip were not in full screen either, so you had to deal with either a black bar going across the screen or a bezel around the gameplay. The big problem though? This chip was expensive to make. In order for Nintendo to make a profit, all the games that had this chip were sold at a higher MSRP. But despite the shortcomings, Star Fox ended up being a commercial success and became a well-established Nintendo franchise. But there was one company that was afraid of the Super FX chip, a company that was competing against Nintendo, Sega. Although a lot of Genesis games compare pretty well to their Super Nintendo counterpart, the Genesis was still two years older than the Super Nintendo and its hardware showed. The Super FX chip only made the Genesis look even more outdated than it already was. Sega tried a few things to get around this. They released two add-ons, the Sega CD and the Sega 32X, which enhanced the capabilities of the Genesis. But one thing they tried that actually was a step in the right direction they started developing their very own chip, just like the Super FX. This one was called the SVP chip, and it actually had superior hardware than both versions of the Super FX chip. Sega decided to port their arcade game Virtual Racing to the Genesis with help from this new SVP chip. On paper, Virtual Racing seemed like a good pick, because the graphics were impressive for its time, but still basic enough for something like the Genesis, at least I would imagine. The cartridge looked really funky, quite a bit bigger than the normal Genesis one. The game starts off with a 3D Sega logo. It's a nice little good first impression. When actually seeing the game in action, it's really mind-blowing. The frame rate is much better than Star Fox. Horizontally, the resolution extends across the whole screen. There are some black bars on the top and the bottom of the screen, but this is still a big improvement over the Super FX chip. Surprisingly, the game has all three stages from the arcade, and a lot of the background details remain too, like the ferris wheel on the beginner stage for an example. The pit stop crew even makes an appearance in the Genesis version. They look awful, but the fact that they made the effort is respectable. It actually impresses me that this game supports up to two players. The SVP chip only allows for a certain amount of 3D polygons on screen at a time, so the fact that they were able to keep the multiplayer functionality is unbelievable. Now, in order to cut down on the amount of polygons on screen, a lot of games will utilize 2D sprites rather than 3D objects. With that said, I'm impressed with the fact that all the cars and background graphics were rendered in 3D polygons. They could have easily made the cars 2D sprites and it would have been understandable, so it's cool that they went the extra mile here. But there are some problems. The graphics are great for the Sega Genesis, but once the novelty wears off, you'll realize how pixelated it looks. The draw distance isn't great, so you may not notice a turn coming up until it's too late. The pixelation in general makes it difficult to see what's in front of you. The arcade version used a steering wheel, which gave you way better control over your car. Here though, you're stuck with the D-pad on the Sega Genesis controller. Yeah, good luck using a D-pad on a game like this. There wasn't much they could have done to improve this, the Genesis doesn't support analog controls, but I have to mention it because it's difficult to control your car. Most of the turns you have to make are too sharp, so you have to constantly slam on the brakes to slow down in order to make your turn sharper and avoid crashing. I feel like a lot of game developers do this with early racing games. To make up for not having analog controls, they make every turn too sharp so you have to use the brakes constantly. Now, apparently, the SVP chip has extended sound capabilities, but when I listen to the game, I don't notice it. 
The game doesn't have any music outside of a 5 second loop every checkpoint, so you're going to hear the sound of the car the whole time, and it gets annoying fast. Also, can you tell what the voice is saying every checkpoint? Because your guess is as good as mine, honestly. The biggest problem with this game? The lack of replayability. Now there are various difficulty settings, which that's better than nothing, but once you've beat all three stages, well, you've pretty much seen the entire game. Now for an arcade game, this is acceptable, but for a home console game, it gets boring really fast. I'm surprised they don't have a tournament mode where you have to beat the stages in order. Maybe it wasn't possible due to the limitations, I don't know, but it would have been cool if it came up with something. So remember how Star Fox was an expensive game in order to compensate for the Super FX chip? Well, guess how much this game sold for when it was first released? $100. That pretty much sums it up right there. If it were 5 bucks, then I'd be perfectly fine with the lack of content. But $100 for this? No thanks. When you first play the game, it's really cool to experience, but once the novelty, or gimmick, whatever you want to call it, wears off, you're left with a mediocre game. If this were sold at a lower price point, this would get a pass, but at $100, this is a disappointment. So you might be thinking, come on Poger, they couldn't sell this at a lower price, the chip was expensive to make already. Well, that's actually kind of my point. Maybe Virtual Racing wasn't the best game to use the SVP chip on. Maybe a game with more variety would have been better. Apparently, Sega was actually planning on utilizing the SVP chip for other games like Daytona USA and Virtual Fighter. Those two games would have been cool to see, but like with Virtual Racing, I'm not sure if it would have turned out well or if it just would have been a gimmick. Unfortunately, there were no other games released that used the SVP chip, only Virtual Racing. Sega did have plans of releasing a lock-on cartridge that contains the SVP chip, sort of like Sonic & Knuckles, where you put the game on top and it will utilize the SVP chip. That way, you don't have to sell every game that takes advantage of the SVP chip for 100 bucks. But this idea ended up not happening. Unfortunately, the SVP chip was never spoken of again. Because home consoles were not as powerful as the arcade machines, game developers were looking for ways to expand the capability of the games. Argonaut wanted to port their own game to a Nintendo console, but when that wasn't possible, they teamed up with Nintendo to create Star Fox. When Sega took wind of this, they ported Virtual Racing. While I do think the game is really impressive, it doesn't play that well, and there isn't much content here. It's clear that the idea wasn't successful as the SVP chip was never used in any games after this one. So before I end the video, I just wanted to thank a few people. Special shoutouts go to Atari Compendium for info related to Pitfall 2. NES Dog for the helpful guide on the MMC3 chip, Lemon Amiga for the Star Glider screenshots, Sega16, I especially owe these guys a thanks. Most of my content about the SVP chip came from them. And finally, Highway Forever for all the information on virtual racing. With that said, thanks so much for watching this video, guys. Leave a like rating, drop a comment, and subscribe to the channel so you're up to date on my new content. More content is coming by the way. Anyway, have a good one you guys.